the pre-med year session number 370. Hello, and welcome to the pre-med years, where we believe that collaboration, not competition, is key to your success. I'm your host, Dr. Ryan Gray, and in this podcast, we share with you stories, encouragement, and information that you need to know to help guide you on your path to becoming a physician. Now, welcome to the pre-med years. As this episode is coming out, it is Christmas Day. So Merry Christmas if you are celebrating. Happy Hanukkah, which is the same time this year as Christmas, if you are celebrating that. This week, I have a guest who, after I was done talking with her, I said, this episode is coming out on Christmas Day, and it is a gift to you to be able to tell her story. Now, Satonye is a student, like many of you, who have struggled through your journey. Satonye so started working at 14 years old, helping put herself through school, supporting herself as she was a student. And guess what? Sacrifices she made, just sacrificing her ability to do well in school, which was obviously reflected in her grades and in her undergraduate academic performance. Being told over and over and over again that she probably shouldn't or couldn't go to medical school. Now, Satonye, so at the end of this recording, I said, hey, can you send me your GPA from your application? Because I want to see it. I want to be able to show it on the website. So we're going to have a picture of the GPA grid from her application on our website, medicalschoolhq.net slash 370. Her cumulative undergraduate science GPA, 2.59. 2.59 cumulative undergraduate science GPA. 3.09 cumulative or total GPA, right? Total GPA, cumulative GPA, science GPA 259. Got into medical school because of a strong graduate GPA. And she talks about how she was finally able to get to be able to do well. We talk about that. We talk about her MCAT struggles. We talk about her MCAT success and much more. This is your Christmas present from me. I hope you enjoy this episode with Satonye. Satonye, welcome to the pre-med years. Thanks for joining me. Hello, hello. <laughs> Happy to be here. <laughs> I'm so excited to have you. I was so excited when I saw your Instagram post talking about your struggles and more importantly, your successes and ultimately your accomplishments of getting in to medical school. And I reached out immediately. I said, I need to talk to you on the podcast. So thank you so much for taking some time and chatting with me and, and being willing to share your story so others can learn from you. Not a problem. Thank you for ask, for asking me. And also, this is why I did share my story, just so that others could be inspired. When did you first realize you wanted to be a physician? So I kind of have one of those, it's kind of stereotypical um, in the sense of I, I knew since I was young. Um, and there are even things that my parents remind me of. And they say, oh, well, you know, like we used to take you to the pediatrician and you used to ask her about like the other patients and stuff like that, stuff that I don't typically remember. Um, but those were like the beginnings, basically, of me realizing that I was interested in medicine. And I think as I began to go through school, um, I realized that it was definitely that science was a passion for me. And that medicine allowed me to engage some of my other passions at the same time as well. So the unique thing about my story is I have a background in art as well. And I think one of the things that drew me to science was when I realized that art and science were very, very connected. So in junior high school, I was exposed to this. It was... um. It was for inner city kids. So it was like a STEM ex exploration program and they brought in organ models. And for whatever reason, the organ models, they just looked like sculptures to me. So that's how 
this was it was like a marriage between art and medicine. And I think at that moment, it elevated from being just about one passion. And that's when like the marriage began. Did you ever, because you were so interested in art, did you ever potentially see or or were encountered with either negativity on you becoming a physician or any resistance from just your own doubts and uncertainties with becoming a physician go, I'm just going to go be an artist. So for me, I, I knew that I didn't want to do art professionally. I had an interest in art and I, I, I always had a draw towards creativity and creation and whether it was sculpting or drawing or photography or filmmaking, but I knew in my heart of hearts that I wanted to be a doctor and I knew that that was the path for me. And literally during my interviews, I speak about the fact that if I had to go to the moon to become a doctor, I would go to the moon to become a doctor. <laughs> like I just wanted it that bad. So even though art kind of keeps me sane and keeps me balanced, I always knew that I wanted to be a physician. Well, with with climate change, the hurricanes might wipe out all of the Caribbean medical schools. And so they'll have to relocate to the moon. So <laughs> <laughs> the moon will be the new Caribbean medical schools. Hopefully not. Ho- hopefully not. No, hopefully That'd not. It'd be kind of hard to travel during breaks. Um. <laughs> oh, new new technology and in, in transportation will hopefully speed that up. But <laughs> what what is it? So for you, right, you are uh, an African-American female. I speak to so many women like yourself who tell me like, Ryan, I never knew I could be a physician. I never saw women who look like me that are physicians. And so it was just never something I thought of. And so reading your story, right, you're in, in your Instagram posts that you're working from age 14 and doing the closing shift at fast food restaurants all through high school and paying for your college applications on, on such a small wage. Like, mm-hmm. why you? Why not just go, you know what, this isn't for me. I'm just going to go live my life. Like, why? why fight through that? So another, um, I want to say aspect of my personality is I am very community centered Mm. and I have a very huge passion for my community and my surroundings, no matter where I am. So I try to always be involved in like what's going on around me. So I remember when I had my first speaking of just finally getting an experience with an African-American physician. I was maybe about 16 or so. And all I could remember is that I could relate to her so well. And she was just so amazing. Just the way how she practiced medicine, it really just, it, it changed something in me, to be honest. And it was just like another, so if you could imagine I'm going through life and I have like a checklist, right? And it's like, something happens and I'm like, there's another sign. Right. So that was definitely a moment where I was like, wow, this is a sign. Right. Like I, how, how is it that I I have this opportunity? And she wasn't my, my PCP. She wasn't my normal doctor. I just happened to meet her. So that experience was amazing. And when I felt that experience, I wanted others to feel that experience, especially in my community. I thought that was super important because I know what it feels like to go anywhere and to not be understood Mm -hmm. and to be able to relate information to people and to get them to understand that this is for, this is to better your health. Right. And if you're bettering the health of an individual and you're bettering the health of multiple individuals, you're bettering the health of a community and that spreads. So that's why, um, that's part of the reason why I keep going because I want people to have that experience. I want them to be able to experience what it feels like to be understood and to have someone relay things to you in a way that you can actually understand them. That's powerful. I love it. <laughs> you struggled in undergrad. Why, why do you think you struggled so much with undergrad? And, and looking back, what potentially would you have changed to try to be more successful, at least from a, from a GPA standpoint? 
Okay. So yes, undergrad was a complete struggle. And um, I also talk about this in my application, um, my most recent application to medical school. I spoke about the fact that it was a financial disadvantage. And what I mean when I say that is from high school, again, I, I was working. So I never truly developed the skill of being able to just study and to just give my full attention to studying. So when I got to undergrad, there was this new level of prerequisites for medical school. And I was taking classes like organic chemistry and chemistry. And I was taking lab and just classes that required a lot more of my time. And I was always divided. My time was always divided between trying to be financially set to survive and trying to exceed and do well so that I could achieve this goal and this dream of mine of becoming a physician. So when I got to the point in undergrad that I needed to work, I just I I was I said to myself, I said, you know, this is this is just a part of everything you have to go through. And you know, you'll get to a point where you won't have to, you won't have to go through these types of trials, right? If you, if you do what you have to do now, you get through and you get to your goal, life is going to be different on the other side. So that was a part of it. It was just, it was, it was knowing that the financial struggles were temporary and that I just had to keep moving. And I honestly do feel like if I didn't have those financial pressures, I would have done way better in my undergraduate career. I wouldn't have had the burden of trying to figure out. There was literally a time when I emptied my savings account. I had a coin savings in a piggy bank. I emptied my savings account just to get through a week. Mm. So just imagine, right? I'm there. There's maybe like twenty dollars in change in there, and I'm stretching this out over a week, yeah. and typically people don't go through these extra added burdens, right? So it just becomes a process of I have to balance survival and school, and that's that's how it's been, right? So that was just one of the things that if I could change anything. I think that would be it. (laughs) I would, I would change some of the burden that was on me so that I could have been, I could have given more of myself to school. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, it's interesting, right? Even looking back on my journey, when you, when you tell that story of the, the piggy bank or whatever, the, the times that I, I look back and, and not in the same situation where I'm, trying to to scrape together money for food or scrape together money to pay for tuition but i remember like being being broke and like going to the, back in the day when there were still like music stores and going and selling like my whole cd collection cuz i needed some money to to like go out that night or something like that i and and i remember like pawning something at some point uh, luckily i was able to buy it back eventually um but just those financial struggles they're they're hard heartbreaking and and they take such an emotional toll as well as the just the toll of needing to to work and do other things that that take away time. Absolutely. What do you think it was when when you're going through this, right? You you're in school, you're like I'm going to be a doctor and yet your grades aren't potentially saying that you can be a doctor. At at what point if any were you starting to doubt your ability to do this? So I would say somewhere around maybe right after organic chemistry. Um, So the first organic chemistry, if I remember correctly, it actually went well. But organic chemistry, too, I don't believe it went as well. And what I realized is at that point in time, I didn't have support from any of the advisors that I was supposed to work with. So during my junior year of my undergraduate career, it was around then that I realized that my grades were not in the range that they should have been. And at this point, I was literally fighting to raise my GPA while working, while volunteering, 
while I was all, I was working as a medical scribe at one point. So I'm working, I'm juggling all these different facets of my life. And I'm also saying to myself, like, your grades are not where they need to be for you to get into this really competitive next phase of your life. So I didn't have good um, support around me in terms of a a pre-medical advisor or in terms of other advisors. So a lot of the information that I gathered, I literally went out and sought it out on my own. So that meant um, just emailing different people who were successful, who had gotten into medical school already, if I could find them, asking colleagues or um, going to conferences and speaking to different admissions advisors, asking them for advice. I literally just started like crowdsourcing advice. And it got to a point where that's when I realized, okay, my grades are definitely not where they need to be. So at that point in time, I decided, okay, what's going to be my next step? Am I going to do a post back? Um, or am I going to do a graduate degree? What, like, what needs to be my next step? And unfortunately I did not choose either of those options. Then (laughs) (laughs) I ended up, um, listening to some advice that I'm not going to say it wasn't the appropriate advice for myself at the time, Mm -hmm. but I ended up listening to some advice and I decided I'm going to take the MCAT before they, um, they change the exam and I'm going to see how it goes. And hopefully if it goes well, that will be it. And I'll at least have a strong score that did not work out. (laughs) So it was somewhere around junior year that I realized, okay, I, I need to figure out how I'm going to do this because things are not aligning the way that they should have. Yeah. When you, talk to your pre health advisor. I know in one of your posts, you, you talked about how the, the, your pre med advisors weren't very helpful. What was that like to, to go to this person who's at it at the school? They're supposedly to help you. And what, what was that feedback like from them and, and what did you do with it? So this is one of the moments that I reflect on very, very often. And it's interesting to me how, people can have this, um, this kind of power on our lives. Mm. Um, but it was the summer, it was right after my first summer of undergrad. And I basically failed chemistry too. completely failed the class. I'm not talking about a D I am talking about an F. And it was a mistake on my part because I had decided that I was going to take chemistry two over the summer in an effort to kind of offload some of the pressure for the upcoming semester. So I said, I'm going to take chemistry two over the summer and kind of like get it out of the way. Unfortunately, again, I was working that summer. So here I am, I'm working full time at this point and I'm taking chemistry two and it's going terrible and it's going fast. The material is piling on every day and I couldn't keep up with it. And I ended up failing that class. So when I went to my pre-medical advisor, I already knew that it wasn't going to be the most positive information. I already kind of had a sense that she wasn't going to be thrilled about the fact that I failed this class. But what I didn't expect was for her to flat out tell me not to pursue medicine. And I guess in hindsight, she may have felt that she was doing her job, but a lot of people would have took that information and they would have looked at the failure and they would have said, you know what? I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to continue on this journey. I'm going to change my major. I'm going to find another path. And I'm, I'm basically, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pursue my dream anymore, but I left that meeting feeling differently, complete opposite. I left that meeting feeling like you think that I can't do this. You think that I can't make this happen. And it's unfortunate because you don't even know how much you've just invigorated this, um, determination within me. 
And that's literally what it did. It just made me more determined. It made me say, you know what, you, you have faced so many setbacks and so many hurdles and you've persevered. And I knew in that moment I was, I was going to persevere. There was no way that I was going to let the words of one person stop me after I had made it through high school, working part-time while being student body president, while being active in different um, sports clubs and different activities, after I had made it into college against most odds, because most of the people that I went to high school with did not make it into college and they did not go away for college. So I just couldn't, I couldn't take, I couldn't take her advice and stop pursuing my dream because I knew that I, I could persevere. Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's awesome. And I, I wish, I wish, I wish more students had that same determination and confidence that you had after speaking to, uh, what, what is affectionately known as dream crusher advisors that advisors that tell students you can't do this, you shouldn't do this because that's not doing their job, right? You were like, I guess she was just doing her job, but that's not her job. Her job is to see where you are at, figure out where you are struggling and help you figure out a different path to get to where you want to go, not where they think you can or can't go. So right. I'm I'm glad you were able to kind of push her away and push those thoughts out of your head and and figure out a different path to your journey. Let's talk about this small little test called the MCAT. So you <laughs> you took it you took it once the first time, right? You've taken it multiple times. Um you took it the first time. What do you think happened the first time you took it that that went awry? So the first time I took the MCAT, that small little exam. <laughs> um, no biggie. Right. No biggie. Um, so that was my senior year. And it was between it was Christmas break. So it was actually it was actually, I want to say, between December into January. Mm. And the plan initially was I was going to get MCAT books. I was going to study for the MCAT simultaneously while studying for my, you know, classes of that semester. And then I was going to have a month before the exam to kind of solidify information and review. And then I was going to go in and I was going to excel. <laughs> and what went wrong was the fact that it was too much. There was too much going on in my life at that moment for me to really give the exam my full attention and the full amount of effort that it needed. So I completely understand why that exam did not go the way that it should have, because I was not able to give it as much effort as I should have. When I got the score back, I didn't think that it was going to be what it was. Um, and I do talk about the fact that it was under a certain percentile in my post. So that first MCAT, my overall percentile rank was 19%. Okay. So if you can imagine the physical sciences was about a 23 verbal reasoning or cars was 27 and the bio section was 25%. So it went terrible. And I knew that at that point, I didn't know how much I would need to do to rectify that score. But over the next few years, I definitely learned um, that I needed to fix any deficiencies that I had before I was going to be able to overcome that hurdle. That's basically what I learned in the years following that first exam. Mm -hmm. So... He, I keep coming back to or the, the average student that I talk to is the student who, uh, just like you, uh, struggled in undergrad, has an advisor that tells them they can't do this, takes the MCATs. And, and to that average student, all they're doing is collecting evidence and proof that this is not the path for them. How, after killing yourself through undergrad and, and, and getting 
uh, everything that you were able to accomplish in undergrad, uh, and then getting the negativity from an advisor, and then taking the MCAT and, and getting a 19th percentile for the MCAT, and you're sitting there going, okay, I, I guess I got to do something different. <laughs> let, me, let me figure it out. Not, not different as in I can't be a physician, but different as in I need to do something different to get to where I want to go. How is that the mindset still? So honestly, and to be honest with you, this is a part of where my, um, my religion comes in. Um, but I was, I was raised as a Christian. And one thing that I knew if there's nothing else that's important in Christianity, it's faith. And I just had an unreal faith in myself. Mm. I knew that all these things and all these signs that I was seeing as I was growing and becoming older, I knew that it was for a reason. And I really, really believed in it. And it didn't, it just didn't matter to me, you know? And I had so many countless friends and family members. And, you know, like over the years, over the many gap years between college and now, ask me, so like, what are you doing? Why are you still going to be a doctor? What? Just ask me these questions like, um, have you thought about doing anything else? And my answer was always no. It just it didn't make sense to me to actually verbally say that I wouldn't be able to do this. And that's really just what it came down to. I was so determined. And that determination is literally what's carrying me now through medical school also. Because I know that everything that happened happened for a purpose and for a reason. It wasn't just a random occurrence that, to me, it wasn't just a random occurrence that I met this African American physician who revitalized me in my um, in my high school years. It wasn't just an an occurrence that I went to a school where I didn't have the support, but I sought out every single mentor you could possibly find. I I literally have maybe about 20 to 30 different contacts of people who have helped me on my journey in getting into medical school in my phone still. And it just to me, it wasn't it wasn't possible for me to to quit. It was not possible to quit. There was no physical or mental barrier that could stop me, literally. And it didn't matter. It didn't matter what anyone said. It didn't matter what happened. It didn't matter um, what rejection. If I would have, if I had applied another cycle and I had still got no's, it still wouldn't have mattered. And I mean this when I say this, I really did say in an interview that if I had to go to the moon to become a doctor, I would. I was very serious about that. And I just I, I have this determination. And when I when I say that I'm going to do something, I have to accomplish it. And that's literally what kept me going, because for all other reasons, I should have given up. Right. Yeah. Especially with the first MCAT score, I should have given up. After the second MCAT score, <laughs> everything would have said, like, why are you still doing this? You should give up. But I couldn't. I could not. Yeah. So let's let's talk about some more nuts and bolts kind of uh, your, your parts of your journey. So you, you took the MCAT the first time. You got the 19th percentile. You applied... Um, the next cycle or, or a cycle after that without an MCAT score. Now, with that first application cycle, is is that a cycle that you like withdrew your application? You just didn't move forward? Or did you try to move forward with the the score that you got and and it just didn't go well? Like what happened that that cycle, that first application cycle? So my first application cycle I had everything submitted. I was just waiting on my score. I got my score back. And at that point, I decided to move forward. But for financial reasons, I didn't move forward with every school. So what I did was I basically I basically tried to pay in terms of doing secondaries and paying for supplemental application fees. I paid for certain schools, the ones that were closer to home. And I basically did like a strategic, okay, 
this is not going to work out for all of these schools. And some of the schools I already knew they had higher, um, they had higher averages. So I said, let me try for some of these schools and the other ones I'm going to strategically, I guess, eliminate them. Right. Mm. So I did move forward with a, I want to say about 10 of the 15 schools. And what ended up happening was it was rejection after rejection after rejection. So it got to the point where I was just counting down. So if I was at 10, it would, I I was like, okay, well, there's still another nine. There's still (laughs) another eight. (laughs) There's, and when I got that last rejection, I think that was the moment that I said, okay, I need to revise this plan. I'm not going to get in this cycle. What am I going to do now? And the gut feeling was you need to find either a master's program or a post back program. And it needs to be a good one. And you have to excel in this program. So that was the next step. Just immediately when I, the day, the same day that I got the last rejection, I started looking up master's programs. I started researching post-bac programs. I started learning the differences between both of them so that I knew which one would be the next option. How did you know about those types of programs? So I had one friend from undergrad who at the time, I believe she was a first year medical student. And she did a kind of a linkage program. It was a linkage master's program. Mm -hmm. So I was initially, I initially asked her about her program that she did specifically. But when I found out that it was one of those programs where they have to select you, I just researched any program that had a similar um, curriculum. Okay. Okay. So just, just finding out and seeing what was out there and available for you. And how did you, how did you end up picking where you did the program? So, and I'd, I'd like to believe that this is another sign also, but I went on Google and I literally just searched for master's programs, medical school, and I sifted through the list And I looked at location. I looked at cost. I looked at the curriculum. So I I was, it was very important to me that I had a program. It was very important to me that I found a program that was geared towards entrance into medical school, not just a program that would give me a master's of science, but specifically geared towards medical school, because it had to be a program that would rectify some of the deficiencies that I had. And that was my, that was my battle plan. (laughs) And, you know, luckily I was able to find a program that fit me and that kind of, you know, it wasn't too far from home and it worked out in that sense. A lot of students in your situation have a hard time finding these programs, especially for students who have taken the MCAT already, students who have a lower GPA. Uh, A lot of students are having a hard time finding a program that will take them because they'll have MCAT cutoffs, they'll have GPA cutoffs. How did you how did you work your way into this program considering the GPAs that or GPA that you had and the MCAT scores that you are, have already had? So the good thing about the way that I decided to search for programs I specifically looked for programs that were within the ranges of my MCAT score, my second MCAT score, and of my GPA, my overall GPA, not my BCPM GPA, because my BCPM GPA from undergrad was a (laughs) 2.59. So I specifically looked for programs that would accept that range. And the programs that I selected all were within that range. Interesting. Okay. So you were able to find programs that, that worked even with what you had. Yes. That was great. Yes. So what, what shifted for you? Cause I'm assuming right based on you getting into medical school, having multiple interviews, I'm assuming something shifted for you from undergrad 
to your, was it a master's program that you did or a post back? Yeah. So I decided to do a master's of biomedical science okay. program. So mm-hmm. from, from undergrad to your master's, was it the fact that financial obligations were less, you had more time to study? What, what shifted for you that you were able to get the grades you needed to be successful with that, that next application cycle? Okay. So first, I just want to put out this... Um, this information that I think a lot of people get confused on the difference between a post back and a graduate program was, it was a very big um, factor in my decision because something that a lot of people don't know is post back grades apply towards your undergraduate GPA yep. and your graduate GPA is a separate line item on your AMCAS. Correct. So What changed in graduate school is that I received enough aid to cover my living expenses. Mm -hmm. So for the first time ever in life, other than (laughs) elementary school and junior high school, I could just focus on school. Yep. And the change was astronomical because I was receiving A's and I was understanding the information that I needed to understand on a higher, I want to say a higher level. So it wasn't just about, I, there's this item that I need to study. I'm going to memorize it. I wanted to know why that item or why that system or what goes into making that thing that I'm studying, what goes into making it the way it is and getting that higher level of understanding is what resolved some of my deficiencies from undergrad. So once I got those deficiencies cleared up, I could understand the graduate material, which then allowed me to understand the MCAT better also. Yeah. And so, I mean, that's, that's the biggest piece for me, right? Is, is hearing that story and and hearing right you were successful because you were able to dedicate time to being successful and i i think and not to get into a political discussion here uh but but i think that's that's part of this like huge systemic um kind of racism that we have in our system is and, and kind of a lot of the uh, I don't. I don't know the right word for it, but a, a lot of the thought process behind, right? Why do we have lower standards, if you want to call them standards, for uh, for minorities coming into medical school, or even if you want to go all the way back to to college, right? And mm-hmm. and and that's the answer, right? Students who, whether you're a minority or not a minority, but still coming from a disadvantaged background, you from day one, right? From from working at age fourteen, you from day one have not been able to focus on what it what has been needed to focus on to be successful, and and until that was afforded you right through loans which is fine um that was finally given you were finally given that opportunity with your master's program through loans to finally focus on being a student now all of a sudden it's reflected in your gpa which unfortunately is as as admissions committees for medical schools and admissions committees for colleges that's really all they have to go on right is what's your gpa and for someone from a disadvantaged background, it's like, well, my GP doesn't look good because I've had all these obstacles to overcome. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and so that's just kind of my frustration with this whole process and, and trying to get more disadvantaged students into medical school to, to really prove like, hey, I can be an amazing physician. I just need to be able to focus on medical school, right? And once students are in medical school, they have the loans to pay for school so they don't have to work. So... Right. Anyway, Absolutely. random tangent. <laughs> no, I I one hundred percent I one hundred percent support everything you just said. There are systemic differences that literally take opportunities away from people, and they act as a barrier. Yeah, and yeah. overcoming those barriers, you you have to be as determined as I was, if not more. So I I one hundred percent agree with everything you just said. Yeah. 
Well, you you applied. So you you obviously did well in your master's. You you applied again to medical school. What do you think? Obviously, your master's GPA it was a huge difference, and and finally learning how to learn the material and and really letting it sink in, having that time to dedicate to it, affected your MCAT score. Do you think with your application? telling the stories of the obstacles you have to overcome was was that a huge part of your application as well and why do you think and why you think you were successful so the unique thing about my second application cycle is i really wanted the individual or let me put it this way my personal statement actually does not speak about those barriers as much as my secondary applications did. So I literally used my secondary applications whenever they brought up a barrier, uh, overcoming something, um, perseverance. That's when I would plug in those um, anecdotes, basically, about my journey. and. What that allowed me to do was make my personal statement basically reflect my original um, passion for medicine and science and art. (laughs) So my personal statement literally just embodies what makes me unique. And then in the other areas, I was able to speak about being disadvantaged, to speak about the MCAT increase from the first MCAT to the third MCAT to speak about um, studying different and learning how to be a better student and to become a lifelong learner, because that's exactly what you're signing up for as a physician. And that's, that's kind of how I tackled the second application. Mm -hmm. And obviously it reflected in your ability to get interviews and uh, at least one acceptance. What was it like for you to go on the interview trail after after the journey that you went on, being told no by your advisor, being told no by the 15 original medical schools you applied to, to finally have that first mini yes, right? The, the yes will interview you. What was it like to be on your first interview? So to be honest, the day, I'm sorry, I got, I got a little emotional, but the day that I got my first interview offer, I like lost it. (laughs) It was like a unicorn. (laughs) I had never seen an email like that before. So (laughs) it was amazing. And I'm looking at this email and I'm like, oh, I like, I was just so taken by the email because I had never gotten that before (laughs) you're like is this for me there there must be there must be another person with my same name (laughs) i'm like is this real and the moment i got it i just remember i just was like i was calling all my family members and it was in chicago so i had to book a flight and it was just it was an amazing feeling amazing like i if i could bottle up that feeling and sell it (laughs) i'd be a millionaire (laughs) um but it was amazing. And um, every every interview offer after that, completely just floored, completely just grateful. Just it, it made me appreciate the whole process so much more because for, for the first time, it was finally working out and going on interview days. They're long days, but the excitement and just like this feeling of like honor and this feeling of you finally overcame this hurdle. That was enough to carry me through the whole day. (laughs) Like I, I, I'm pretty sure those five days I smiled from morning until night (laughs) because it was just that, that much of a, a feeling of like, this is finally happening. Yeah. Um, So, yes, that was that was kind of what that was like. It was also pretty interesting to have the ability to be kind of like an honored guest at a medical school, because before those moments of being able to interview, I'd always looked at it as, oh, there's like this prestigious institution that I would love to be a student in. But then 
it was kind of like a role reversal because now you have this school that's saying, we're interested in you. Let's show you why you belong here. Yeah. And yeah. seeing some of the extent that they go to, to prove that amazing. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely amazing. It's always, uh, it's like, if you want to take it back, it's like a kind of an us versus them or, or a Cinderella, right? You're the, you're the person outside. Like I want to be invited to the ball. And then all of a sudden you right. are. Right. That's literally perfect anecdote. <laughs> yeah. So what was it like, right? Super emotional to get that interview invite. I can't even imagine what it was like to get the actual acceptance. What was that like on that day? So, and, um, so I, I actually got accepted into two schools and then I got waitlisted at the others. How dare they? Um, yeah, I know. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the actual day that I got my acceptance letter, I was not in the U.S. <laughs> I was in Nigeria. I was at the airport and I was on my way back to the U.S. About to get on this, I think, 17 hour. <sighs> yeah, it was about 17 to 18 hour flight. And I'm about to go through exit customs and I get an email notification and my heart is like racing because at this point, any email that I get, my heart is racing. Um, and I look down and I'm going through the email and the first thing I see in the line is congratulations. And my heart stopped and I started crying and I'm standing <laughs> on this line and I'm crying. And literally I had just said bye to my family. Right. Mm -hmm. So like they just dropped me off at the airport so I'm, I'm trying to like call people on WhatsApp because I don't have regular service. And it was just so funny that this moment that I had always dreamed about happened. And it was literally the most <laughs> inconvenient time. <laughs> so but I was so floored. I I sat in that airport and for the first time ever, it's like I, I felt this like weight off of me. <laughs> it, it was a feeling of you did it. <laughs> you knew you could do it. You told everybody you could do it and you did it. You made it happen. And you didn't make it happen alone. You had lots of support. You had love. You had advice. You had years of working towards it, but you made it happen. And when that, it was just, it, it the feelings washed over me in waves, in waves. And the journey, it didn't even feel as as long to be honest <laughs> because <laughs> i was i was in this like this daze it's the it's the highest feeling in the world honestly yeah. it is it is a pretty unique feeling and i i still believe it's one of the best days of my life um i'm always going to believe that and i honestly wish that for whoever is listening <laughs> and whatever um position you are in now just, you know, it's possible and you can get that feeling. That's yeah. That's just, it was the most amazing feeling I have ever felt. That's awesome. amazing. Yeah. And the second acceptance was pretty sweet too. <laughs> You're like too late. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh. but I will say, um, the scholarship offers also felt pretty, pretty, pretty amazing also. Yeah. And when I when I saw the amounts also, I was I was in shock. <laughs> Let's talk about those for a minute. It's not something we talk a lot about on the podcast. For for the scholarships, is that something that you had to go to the schools and say, "Hey, like I'd love to come, show me the money," or did they reach out once you were accepted and say, "Here's what we're willing to offer you?" So for the first set of offers from the first school that I was accepted to, um it was, I believe it was a diversity, a diversity scholarship. Okay. And that was kind of, I believe it was standard. Mm -hmm. And then they give you your need-based aid scholarship also after that. So I don't know if, um, if you've spoken about that before on the podcast, but need-based aid is something that they just, once they look at the, um, once they look at the breakdown of the class, they can then offer money depending on um, your need. So if your need is a little bit higher than your other classmate, they can offer you a little bit more money in scholarship, vice versa. Yeah. 
with the school that I ultimately decided to go to, I applied for a scholarship. It was my second acceptance. So I applied for a scholarship and that scholarship was 40,000 over the course of two years. Mm -hmm. And it, I, it was, I was informed afterwards that it's the, one of the most competitive scholarships that they had. So being able to actually write the essay and submit it on time and everything and actually win that scholarship was also an amazing feeling. And that's what I was referring to. Mm -hmm. Um, that feeling was amazing. Um, and then the need based aid on top of it, it basically covered the majority of my tuition for my first two years, which is again, magical. (laughs) Nice. Um, mm -hmm. that's awesome. What's, what's in store for you for the future? Wow. (laughs) That's a loaded question. Um, so what's in store? Um, so right now, uh, literally right now, as we speak, I am getting ready for the end of my first semester. Um, it's been a very interesting semester. It's been so different, but I'm just constantly reminded every day that I'm so happy to be here. And I think that's kind of what keeps me going because for a long time, this was not seen as possible. And here I am now actually doing that. Right. So in the short term, it would be finishing the semester. And in the long term, I, I don't just want to practice. I definitely, I definitely feel a very strong um, desire to help and to give back in any way I can. And that's something that I have maintained throughout all the years of my life. And that goes back to helping the community. So I definitely want to continue to reach back and to help other people on their journeys. And I've had people reach out to me and ask for any type of advice and I give it as I, as I can. So I just want to continue helping people in that aspect. Um, I'm not set on what specialty I'm going into yet. Um, I do have various interests, so I'm, I'm not quite sure where I'll end up, but I think overall that's, that's basically just what I see in the future. Just continuing to work towards this goal, continuing to fight and not taking no for an answer. Did you ever reach back out to your pre-med advisor and let her know that you got in? So I did not, but um, I think one of the things that happened this year that was super gratifying um, and I don't know if you, if you've had any guests talk about the student national medical association, we haven't talked about SNMA much no. Okay. Is it okay if I do? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. So just to, just to clarify, the student national medical association was created to drive a diverse, culturally competent and socially conscious group of physicians. So SNMA goes to great lengths to make sure that um, underrepresented minorities are able to get into medical school and to succeed. And they do a yearly conference called the Annual Medical Education Conference. And the conference for this year was in April. And at that conference, there was a small reunion of some of the people that went to my undergrad Mm. All people who are now well on their way in their first, second year, third year, even fourth year of medical school. Um, one of my my other peers, he's MD PhD. So we just had a mix of students who were all under this pre medical advisor that made it into medical school. And if you went and you asked, right, so maybe it was about 10 of us, right? If you went and you asked, how many people did she actually support? It was maybe one or two out of all 10 of us. Mm. But somehow, 
There were eight of us that did not take her no for an answer who were in medical school or about to enter medical school and excelling and succeeding and doing amazing. And I think that moment was like the gratification of, I don't even need to reach out to this, to this um, individual. I know that the information that she's giving out is doing more, more harm than it is good. And at that point, I just made a decision that if there's any students that are pre-medical at that school that want to reach out for any type of help or assistance, I will help you myself if I have to. And I, I truly stand behind that. And I truly mean that, but me reaching out and saying, Hey, you know, you were wrong. Not even, not even necessary. And I'm pretty sure that they record, um, that they report MCAT scores. Yep. <laughs> so I'm sure, very, very sure that she was able to see that score as well. And um, I'm super proud of that final score also because I worked so hard for it. What was that final score? You didn't mention it. So my, my first MCAT was a 19. Yep. And if you convert it, um, the increase from my first MCAT to my last MCAT would be 17 points. Nice. My final MCAT was a 507. Amazing. And my percentile ranks. So for chem phys, sorry, for chem phys, uh, sorry. Yes. Okay. So my, my overall percentile rank so from a 19 to a 73, um, chem fizz was a 55 cars was a 82 bio biochem was a 91 percentile and psych soak was a 62 percentile. Wow. So, so yeah, an increase of 17 points and in terms of percentile rank overall from 19 to 73%. Incredible. And that is years <laughs> of determination. <laughs> yeah. Years of resilience, determination, yep. and finally being put in a position to show your academic capabilities. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast and sharing your story, Satonye. So, for the student out there struggling right now, being told by an advisor, being told by someone else, being told by themselves that they can't do this, that they shouldn't do this, but they want to do it. What kind of final words of wisdom do you have for them to let them know that they can and should, if they want to continue down on this path? So my final words of wisdom are to find your supporters, find your mentors, Find the people who will remind you when you even doubt yourself, you got this, you can do this. Um, that's, that's number one. <laughs> number two would be my story from the beginning through the middle and very close <laughs> to the end spelled out. I could not accomplish this goal. If I was able to accomplish this goal, if I was able to overcome these obstacles, there is nothing stopping you from doing it. If someone has done something before, there is nothing that makes that thing impossible because Preach. someone's done it. Preach. I love so, that. <laughs> so I just, my final, final words are just stay committed, stay determined and persevere. You got this. Literally, you got this. <laughs> All right, so there you have it. An amazing story of someone. And and I mention it, I kind of go off on a rant at some point in there in the interview, the discussion about students coming from disadvantaged backgrounds, not being able to fully show who they are because of all of the other responsibilities that you have to take on. And it's the perfect example of why Medical schools look at students, whether they're underrepresented minorities, whether they're from disadvantaged backgrounds, medical schools look at that and it weighs in and is factored into admissions decisions. It should be because students coming from disadvantaged backgrounds 
are at a disadvantage. It's the whole, it's in the name. And Satonye overcame. And now she's in medical school. So I hope you enjoyed this episode. I hope this gave you some motivation. I know a year or two or three ago now, it's been a while, uh, I told another story of a student who did what, uh, who did poorly at Cornell, a really uh, obviously great undergrad, didn't do well. I think she finished with a 2.7 GPA. And I know it's a very, very, very popular episode and, and blog post on my website, hearing her story of not doing well and then getting into medical school after doing a master's program. So hopefully this brings some motivation, some encouragement to you as you go on your journey. You can find Satonye on Instagram. She is simply underscore so-so. Again, that's simply S-I-M-P-L-Y underscore so-so. Go check her out on Instagram. Say hello. Let her know that you heard about her story here on the Pre-Med Years podcast. If you know someone that needs to listen to this episode, this specific episode, just send them to medicalschoolhq.net slash 370. Hope you have a Merry Christmas, a Happy Hanukkah, and a Happy New Year. This is MedEd Media.